Well, wow, this video marks the 10th video in the series, the 11th if you count the introduction. And with that coincides us reaching the 20th century, the only century in this series of elections stretching all throughout, well, at least for now. And it would be a lie to claim the start of his century was uneventful, as the 1902 election would take place right off the end of the Dreyfus Affair, with ongoing attempts to pick up the pieces of a France that had been so bitterly divided by the whole affair. After the 1898 election followed weeks of deadlock, following which Henri Brisson would succeed at forming a government. Would his government be able to forge a legacy, or would it fall in this precarious political environment? The 1902 French legislative election took place on the 27th of April and 12th of May 1902 to elect 589 deputies, a new record except for the first 1871 election, to the French National Assembly. So yeah, Brisson's government did not last long. It only lasted 120 days, up until October 26, 1898, when it fell following a no-confidence vote from the House, which came after three ministers of war resigned close together. Brisson had only secured a majority to govern thanks to support from the progressives, and thus made a big mistake when he staffed his cabinet almost entirely with radicals. Despite its short tenure, it would be inaccurate to claim that Brisson's second cabinet was historically insignificant, as much happened within his four months tenure. The Dreyfus Affair, which had begun nearly four years earlier, was still raging on, and the status quo of ignoring the affair that the national French government had been upholding became less and less sustainable. The affair would take up all of the government's attention and would prevent Brisson from implementing his policies, such as the creation of an income tax. Godefroy Cavignac, the Minister of War in Brisson's government, who was a devoted anti dreyfusard was determined to definitely prove Alfred Dreyfus's guilt. He would begin using his position to investigate the behind-the-scenes actions taken by the army in the affair. The French army desperately wanted to sweep the Dreyfus affair under the rug, but that seemed less and less likely as the Dreyfusard movement grew. With a retrial looking likelier and likelier, the army soon decided it would need additional evidence to prove Dreyfus's guilt. It was from this that a lieutenant colonel named Hubert Joseph Henry would forge a document that in his eyes would seal the case. It remained in the army's arsenal for nearly two years until it would be investigated by one of Cavignac's subordinates named Louis Quignet. Late one night, Quignet would discover that the document had been forged from the sticking together of multiple letters. He would soon bring his fightings to Cavignac, who despite his deep anti dreyfusard convictions would summon Colonel Henry for questioning. After more than an hour of interrogation, the lieutenant colonel would break down and confess to having forged the letter, something that got him sent to prison for forgery. Just like that, one of the army's best pieces of evidence had been discredited, which left the case against Dreyfus much weaker than it had been previously. The discovery would slightly shake Cavignac's conviction that Dreyfus was guilty, and he would resign the position of Minister of War, starting a crisis that led to the government's downfall. Besides the discrediting of the faux Henri, the second Brisson government had no major domestic impact, but it did have several foreign policy successes. The United States and Spain would be brought together to discuss the terms of the Treaty of Paris, which brought an end to the Spanish-American War. In addition, following a colonial dispute with Great Britain, the Franco-Russian alliance would be strengthened, now encompassing a diplomatic partnership rather than just a military one. Following the fall of the Brisson government, the position of Prime Minister would pass back to returning Charles Dupuis who for the final time would now form a government with the support of the radicals. And unlike Brisson, Dupuis would actually share his cabinet, splitting positions 50-50 between the radicals and progressives. Dupuis would largely be a lame duck, just as Brisson had been, as his short tenure would be dominated by the affair. Dupuis desperately tried to stop the court of causation from re-examining the Dreyfus case from 1894, feeling pressured by the anti-Semitic riots carried out by anti dreyfus arts. In the midst of all this chaos, another shocker would strike the nation when President Felix Faure would suddenly die while having an affair with a young woman who was visiting the Elysee Palace. The sudden death would trigger a new presidential election, which would see former Prime Minister Emile Lubet elected president. Despite strong opposition from the nationalists who viewed him as a Dreyfusard, the Republic could not rest as mere days later on February 23, 1899, Paul Derouillette, who had relaunched the Patriot League and had used it to be elected to the House in 1898, would lead a march on Paris alongside General Godenique Roger in hopes of using the instability created by Ford's death to overthrow the government. The Dupuy government would attempt to prosecute Derouillette alongside the other leaders of the plot, but they would all be acquitted of charges on May 31, 1899. This miscarriage of justice would cause the House of Deputies to vote no confidence in Dupuis, and he would be forced out of a top job for the final time. Pierre Waldeck Rousseau, who had previously served as the Interior Minister under both Gambetta and Jules Ferry, would next form a government, continuing the cooperation of the progressives and radicals, while receiving support from many socialists as well, with socialist Alexandre Millerand receiving the Commerce portfolio. He would declare his government to be the government of Republican defense, being committed to defend the Republic and to resolve the Dreyfus Crisis. 
Waldeck Rousseau came from a moderate faction of the progressives and had developed a centrist reputation over the previous few months. If anyone was going to unify the Republic, it would be him. Waldeck Rousseau swearing in would nearly coincide with the French Court of Cassation making its verdict on the Dreyfus case, overruling the ruling from five years prior and asking for a retrial. This brought on more vitriol from the nationalists and anti dreyfus groups, but such actions taken over the past few years had helped polarize the rest of the French political class to be more in favor of Dreyfus than they had been previously. Dreyfus's retrial would end just like the first, with him being found guilty once again, although this time he was only given a 10-year prison sentence instead of a life one. Waldeck Rousseau would intervene, however, and he worked out a deal with Dreyfus. As part of a deal, Dreyfus would confess his guilt, but in return Waldeck Rousseau would ask President Loubet to pardon him. Dreyfus agreed, and the deal went through, with Waldeck Rousseau and Loubet pardoning not only Dreyfus, but all those involved in the affair, finally putting it to an end. Through incredible struggle both judicially and politically, the Dreyfus affair had come to an end, but its memory would continue to linger. The government of Republican defense had been formed as an anti-nationalist coalition, and that continued even after the affair concluded. Even despite them having dropped monarchism, a disdain for the Republic still largely plagued the nationalists. Waldeck Rousseau would spend the rest of his tenure fighting back against the nationalists through a multitude of methods. First, he would re-engage the anti-clericalism that had been dropped by Jules Méline years earlier to weaponize against the clerical nationalists, and he would also order the building of a multitude of statues and other monuments to honor the Republic against the anti-Republican sentiments of the nationalists. Waldeck Rousseau would also push for public reforms in a way that hadn't been seen since the second ferry government. Waldeck Rousseau would pass a law guaranteeing liberty of association, which followed a law passed by the ferry government allowing public meetings by removing the limit of 20 people that existed in the law. Waldeck Rousseau, bolstered by the radicals that supported the government, would also crack down on public religion in ways that had never been seen before. Statutes abandoned by the Melian government regulating Catholic congregations would be revived, and the government would attempt to crack down on public displays of religion, such as by attempting to get the La Croix magazine shut down. These attacks revived a rivalry between the Republic and Catholicism that had been fought reconciled just a few years ago. On the economic front, the government of Republican defense would stop the policy of repressing strikes that had been political conventional wisdom over the past decade, and introduced a policy of arbitration, in which business and union leaders would be brought together to negotiate. The government would also pass laws that limited working hours per day to 10 hours in factories in which children worked and 12 hours in factories where only adults worked. Going into the election, something special would occur as for the first time modern political parties began to spring up. The first of these to be created came from radicals, when in June 1901 they would come together to create the Radical Republican and Radical Socialist Party, or just the Radical Party for short, which would be little more than a rebranding for the radicals. The more moderate radicals for their part would organize themselves into their own group, calling themselves independent radicals, differentiating themselves from the Radical Party by their moderation on economic matters. On the other side of Parliament, Pierre Waldeck Rousseau and other centrist and moderate progressives such as Maurice Rouvier and rising star Raymond Poincaré would organize themselves into the Democratic Republican Alliance in response to the creation of a radical party. The party went by many names over its lifetime, so for simplicity I shall just refer to it as the Democratic Alliance. This left the remaining more conservative progressives, who would not organize themselves into their own political party until after the election. Further right, Albert de Munn and Jacques Piu, two former monarchists, would come together to form the Popular Liberal Action, or just Liberal Action, a conservative Republican party which was supposed to unify both moderate Republicans and conservative Catholics. The party would come to oppose both the anti-Republicanism of a nationalist as well as the anti-clericalism of a current government. What remained of a nationalist would form their own party, the Nationalist Party, which would be led by none other than Paul Deroulette, who was free after being acquitted back in 1899. On the socialist side of parliament, things went less smooth. The Workers' Party would fight amongst itself on whether or not to participate in the government of national defense. Leader Jules Guest, who was an orthodox Marxist, was against any participation in what he saw as a government of the bourgeoisie, while other socialists like Millerand or Jean Jaurès saw things differently. This would cause the party to split in two, with those opposed to cooperation led by Jules Guest forming the Socialist Party of France, while those in favor of cooperation led by Jaurès would form the French Socialist Party. Very different names, I know. These two parties would work together, yet they would remain separate for multiple years. Ahead of the election, a new electoral alliance would be formed, called the Left Bloc, which would be made up of a radical party, the Independent Radicals, as well as the Democratic Alliance Party, which aligned with the radicals on multiple issues. The Progressives and the Liberal Action, on the other hand, who were opposed to Waldeck Rousseau, would form their own coalition, called the... 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 come on... the... wait, what's it called? Huh? It doesn't have a name? Well yeah, this coalition did not have a name, but it colloquially went by the name of a parliamentary right because it was made up of, well, the parliamentary right. 
The coalition would take a conservative stance from a Republican perspective, mostly opposing the anti-clerical policies of the Waldeck Russo administration. This election cycle was dominated by policy much more than previous ones had been, where personality had played a much bigger factor. Waldeck Rousseau campaigned on his moderate record. While he was attacked all over by the parliamentary right, the socialists and the nationalists over several of his policies. Whether it was the anti-clericalism or his industrial policies, which the socialists saw as not going far enough. Now let's see the results. The newly formed left bloc came out of the election in first place, successfully winning 295 seats and 50.1% of the vote, winning the absolute minimum of seats required for a majority. Waldeck Rousseau's strong position and his government's moderation and big tent approach had allowed the bloc to achieve a solid victory. This marked the first time since the 1889 election a single coalition won an outright majority of the seats. The parliamentary right came in second. They won 216 seats with 36.6% of the vote, which left them as a strong opposition force within parliament and would give them a major role in the balance of power in the House of Deputies. The socialists came in third, together winning 43 seats and 7.3% of the vote, a slight decrease from the last election yet it still left them as the third biggest players in parliament. Jaurès's French Socialist Party had come out on top of the Socialist Party of France in a seat count, coinciding with Jaurès winning a seat back, while Guess had lost yet again. Positioning Jaurès as the de facto leader of the Socialist Partnership, the Nationalists collapsed in this election, as they could only win 35 seats with just 6% of a vote, a far cry from their performance just four years earlier when they theoretically could have played a role in forming a government. As had become tradition by this point, Waldeck Rousseau would resign a month after the election was held, as the new deputies took their seats. The task of forming a government would go to Emile Combes, a senator from the Radical Party first elected in 1885 who was also the mayor of Pons, a small town on the outskirts of Bordeaux. Governing with a single-seat majority would be very difficult, so in negotiations Combes convinced Jaurès's French Socialist Party to give the government confidence. This gave the government a more workable 30-seat majority, which would make governing much easier. After more than a decade in opposition, the radicals were finally at the helm of a stable government again, and one that had a workable majority, something the two previous short-lived radical administrations could not boast. Thank you for watching and tune back in next time for the election of 1906.